everybody, my name is Antonio Roberts. I'm the curator of the No Copyright Infringement Intended exhibition um, here in Phoenix and Leicester. And uh, thank you all for coming to the uh, panel discussion, Copywriters Frame and Prison. Um, hope we've invited well, the uh, some of the artists that are involved in it. So starting from uh, right to left, or my right to left, Ronan Deasley and Andrea Wallace, who are responsible for the uh, display at your own risk piece, which is downstairs. Um, then. Duncan Poulton, who has a video of Pygmalion. And finally, we've invited a special guest speaker, <laughs> Dr. Shane Burke, a lecturer in law at Cardiff University. And yeah, the discussion is going to be largely around copyright in the digital age. So um, if you haven't had a chance to explore the exhibition, we, well, this place is open until about 10 or a bit later, and we'll be talking about the works anyway. But um, it's more, the, the discussion is going to be focusing, as well as the exhibition, around how artists and people just living digitally today are challenging ideas around copyright and authorship because you know, we all share images online all the time, we all remix, remake things and it's interesting how this is challenging copyright laws that have been established since like the 19 and 1800s and how is it, is it working with it or working against it. So um, I think just before we get to everyone's introductions I'm just going to have a a little bit of intro into like my thoughts going into the curating of it. So um, I remember it started with discussions um, with Chris Tyra, the uh, digital arts manager here at Phoenix. And <clears throat> again, it was just about, I work digitally, yet my activities largely online are illegal in many ways. And there are laws being put through to stop this activity, whether it might be making a meme, sharing cat videos, or then you get to, I guess, more illegal side of things, downloading and sharing videos and movies. Um, and a lot of this is um, frowned upon, shall I say. <laughs> and it's getting to the point where you can almost copyright a, an aesthetic, a look, a style, rather than just a tangible object. And so coming into deciding which artworks to have in the exhibition, I wanted to look at those um, sometimes in a, some of the artworks, you maybe will agree, are quite light-hearted. So you might have seen the uh, shark sculptures, um, whereas that was involved in quite a big copyright case um, involving many lawyers. And then the Rihanna videos, again, something about appropriation, a corporate appropriation. Um, and so these artists as well, some of them, like the Nefertiti head, they went into it knowingly uh, being aware that their actions are highly political and highly um, oh, wrong and bad. Uh, whereas, yeah, the shark, the person who made the sh left shark, the shark sculptures, is just part of their activity. It's an incidental, just normal, it's very normalized, their activity. So, yeah, going into it, wants to explore like what they're doing and how it fits into or works against these copyright laws, especially as going forward, it's only going to get in some ways worse. Like the copyright laws are going to get more restrictive. There are going to be more cases of people being sued. So it's important that we as artists, creative people are made aware of the work, things that we're working under, the laws that are governing us uh, as a way to understand it and potentially combat it before it gets too restrictive. So that's my little introduction. And uh, yeah, we're going to start with introductions from everyone here. Uh, about their art and work, their thoughts around the exhibition, a bit of a discussion, and then we will open it up to the floor. But um, yeah, I think we'll start with, uh, I believe it's uh, Ronan? Yes. Thanks, Antonio. I'm not really an artist, right? I should say that right from the gate. We're not really artists, are we, Antonio? We're not really. We've, well, we're, ac we're academics, yes, right? Yeah. Although we've transcended yeah. academia now, maybe we are artists. Um, so I'm, a, it's, I'm the Professor of Copyright Law at Queen's University Belfast. So I've spent, oh, 15, 20 years thinking about copyright, writing about copyright, and a lot of the work that I've done recently is um, concerned with exploring uh, the opportunity that copyright law presents, creatively uh, and otherwise. Okay, I mean, because copying gets has a bad reputation, right? We're told as kids in school, don't copy, right? That's what we're told. Don't do, do your own work. Don't copy someone else's work. We're told it's a bad thing to copy. Um, and copyright law, copyright norms, artists worry about uh, infringement, galleries worry about infringement, they should be worrying about infringement in this case, I'll say a little bit more about that at the end. Um, so copying's got a bad reputation, but it, it can be a, 
like a, an incredibly positive and creatively positive phenomenon. And it underpins all life on the planet, copying. DNA replication is based on a process of the subdivision and replication of cells. Uh, the socialization and education of babies and children is all based on copying. We learn by copying what other people do. That's how we begin to navigate our way in the world. And that happens not just as children, but when we're adults as well. Physical synchronicity is a very real phenomenon. You know, we signal to other people that we like them by copying and mimicking their behavior, laughter, and so on. Uh, so I think there's a really positive case to be uh, made for copying, both just in a, in a social sense, but also in a creative uh, and a legal sense. The trick, of course, with copyright is knowing when you can copy and when you can't, when you need permission to appropriate and when you don't. And that's really difficult to know because copyright isn't just a property right. It bestows economic rights on, on artists and, and, and others, but it also creates space for the creative reuse of other people's work. You know, we have exceptions uh, written into the copyright regime that let us parody other people's work, that let us quote from other people's work. There are, there are spaces um, written into the law that allow us to make use of other people's work without permission. But we don't, and um, you know, 99 times out of 100, we can't know whether what we're doing is lawful or not. And that's because these exceptions and these spaces turn on concepts like fairness. Is what you're doing fair? Well, how long is a piece of string? It's impossible to say. It's impossible to quantify. We were talking about this earlier. There's no rule that says taking eight seconds of a song is fine. Taking nine seconds of a song is not fine, right? It, it all depends on context. And that unknowability and that uncertainty that is structurally embedded in the copyright system uh, allows uh, plenty of scope, I think, for play. In a way that if somebody comes along and says, you can't do that, that's my work. I think it's perfectly legitimate to say, well, I think I have an exception here. I, I think the law lets me make use of your work without your permission. If they say, well, you can't, you say, well, I can. You can't know who's right or wrong unless something gets litigated, unless it goes to court, unless a judge says this was fair, this was not fair. So most of the time, when we are mediating the world creatively, we do so in that kind of space, a space that is bounded by uncertainty. And that shouldn't be inhibiting. I think that should feel liberating for creators. Um, and on that note, I'm, I'm going to pass on, but, uh, 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 pass on to Shane, I think. But I just want to finish by thanking Phoenix and thanking uh, the Arts Council England for funding and hosting what may or may not be an infringing exhibition. Right? <laughs> There's all sorts of work downstairs. Our work, we say, we think it's lawful because we're relying on exceptions to let us do what we're doing. We didn't ask anyone's permission to reproduce those, those images. Um, but we think what we're doing is lawful. We don't know it's lawful, but we think what we're doing is lawful. And that's as good as it gets. Right? That's, I'm a professor of copyright law. That's as good as it gets. That's all I can tell you. Um, so Phoenix must know that some of this stuff might also be infringing. And yet they're willing to host an exhibit. Good for them. Because if we get sued, they will be named as a co-defendant. <laughs> <laughs> also, Arts Council England paid for the production of all of the work downstairs. Most of it, yes? All of it? Yeah. A lot of the insta, a, lot, a, lot, a lot of the costs, right? They're bankrolling it. They're funding it. We get sued. Arts Council England will be named as a co-defendant, which is awesome. <laughs> now, I don't know if they thought about that when they agreed uh, to fund this exhibition. I like to think they did. It would be the socially, institutionally, legally responsible thing to do. Who knows? Unfortunately, they're not here to speak to that. But we'll ask them. Okay, uh, Shane. Okay, thanks, Ronan. Um, 
First of all, I get my thank yous out of the way and just say thanks to Antonio and to Phoenix for inviting me. It's lovely to be here. It's my first time in Leicester, so thoroughly enjoying that. Um, as was said, I'm a lecturer in, in intellectual property law in Cardiff University. Um, I come from an arts background. I won't bore you with the details, but, um, you know, I, I love the integration between art and law on in a number of levels. Um, I, I was a little bit worried about the talk this evening. I feel a little bit analog for this talk. Um, I've recently completed doctrinal studies um, on copyright and conceptual art. Um, and I've also written an article recently on copyright as medium. So uh, through the PhD and this article, I'm becoming more and more interested of how law has slipped inside the frame of the artwork rather than just documenting it. Um, perhaps going back to Duchamp and as his practices were perhaps uh, refined by the conceptual art movement and others since, um, you know, art has become more and more subject to legal definition, to institutional validation. Um, you know, we were just joking about this a moment ago. It's become much less about the craftsman with the chisel, you know, uh, the, the painter with the brush. Um, and, and law has become um, integral in maintaining that link between the artist and the work. But you know, particularly in, in recent decades, we've begun to see that slip even further and we've begun to see law become an artistic raw material. Um, many artists using contract law, for example, that, uh, you know, is attached to the work um, as, as part of their work. And we've, as we see with this exhibition and as we've seen with others, you know, copyright has actually become an artistic raw material, which I find very interesting. Um, so what I would stress and what I'm interested in is this kind of reflexive relationship between um, art and law. Um, you know, we have certain artists, which I'm sure we'll talk about, you know, Richard Prince, Jeff Koons, that seem to be influencing how exceptions to copyright are interpreted. Um, you know, cases concerning their work seems to be pushing the boundaries of where these exceptions are. It's an interesting time you know, in terms of copyright in itself, maybe a time of flux. We, you know, creativity um, is becoming more central, a uh, more central concept in terms of copyright. Um, but yet there's an uncertainty as regards what kind of creativity that will be. Um, there's still many works on the margins that we're not sure. Um, you know, there's so much uncertainty, you know, as Ronan has alluded to, the exceptions, they're ad hoc, they're case specific. They're extremely hard to rely on. Um, but there are also, like I said, there are also chinks of light. We have a number of exceptions here, new exceptions, relatively new exceptions, parody, you know, quotation, where we might talk about that. Perhaps, that perhaps there's some latent flexibility there as well. You know, so th there are some promising signs. Um, and that's it. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about open access and things like that today. And, and I'm... I'm a lot of my study has been around, research has been around social norms, and I find it interesting that there may be parallels um, between what, you know, the kind of sharing that has gone on throughout art history and what people are doing now with legal means in, in perhaps a digital environment. So that, that might be something interesting we could talk about. Um, and that's it, really. Um, interesting time. I, I I was going to mention Brexit, but I don't have the heart. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have the heart. Let's keep it up. Let's, <laughs> let's, 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 keep it up let's leave that uncertainty. Great. So um, I'm Andrea Wallace. I'm also an academic, but I hesitated when Ronan said uh, we're not artists because I went to art school. Yeah, and Andrea. <laughs> <laughs> Before I went to law school. So that's a kind of a bit of me that I like to, to hold on to. Um, but I do think very visually when I'm, I'm working through the law and a lot of time that ends up implicating copyright. So what my current research is about, um, and this is what I was downstairs with display at your own risk. Okay, so if you saw the images of works that you may or may not recognize, um, these are works that institutions have said are their own original works. And so they claim a copyright in them because when you claim a copyright, it's not just the right to prevent other people from copying your work. It 
implies that the work itself is a new original work and it comes from you as the author. So when cultural institutions digitize the works that they hold in their collection, and especially when that work is in the public domain, meaning at one point the artist held a copyright and the copyright expired, or sometimes there was never a copyright because it was created before copyright ever existed, um, when the institution makes a copy of that work, so digital reproduction, puts it online, claims a copyright in that, and says, copyright, Musée de Louvre, right? So the Mona Lisa, therefore, online, is a new original work by the Musée de Louvre, even though in its institution, it's the Mona Lisa by da Vinci, which existed before copyright ever, ever existed. Um, so to me, there's this kind of this tension between owning the, the work and providing access to that for all of us members of the public to reuse because it's in the public domain, it's a part of our common cultural heritage, and that's why these works are out there for all of us to repurpose. Um, and then there's also the tension between making a copy of that and saying, no, 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 this is our original work and now you must pay us in order to use this in your own process. So this is something that we wanted to tease out and we did a huge survey of all of these institutions, downloaded works that were made available online, printed the digital reproductions to the size of the original work. So, you know, sometimes 20 by 24 inches and presented them as the cultural institution's new original works. So you look at them, the title of the work is actually the title of the file. So it's something like X200 underscore 157 underscore, you know. Um, the artist is actually the museum, and then all the information about the medium or the dimensions come from, you know, it's a JPEG file, it's RGB, it's X amount of, of gigabytes or megabytes, depending on the quality of the file that's made available online. Um, so we were really interested in kind of teasing out the politics of possession and how this society gains access to works, whether they're the works on site or the works that are made available online, and what new dialogue we're creating when we claim copyright in these copies by saying, this is my original work. Um, and it's something that I think also, I know, not think, um, is something that the artists from the Nefertiti hack are teasing out. And it's something that re they're really interested in as well. And I'm so obsessed with this piece because I don't know if you know the background, but they visited a museum in Berlin with uh, a Kinect Microsoft camera hidden underneath a scarf and circled the bust of Nefertiti, which you're not allowed to take photographs of. And there's no other way to get a photo of this and use it unless you go to the institution's website and, and use it according to their reuse, which is very restricted. Um, but in order for the public to get access, you either have to pay the money to go to Berlin and visit it, you know, or go online. So they circled it, scanned the data, um, handed it over to someone to prepare for online, and then released it to the public. So the public has taken it and repurposed it and turned it into Pez dispensers and earrings and giant potted plants. Um, it's been completely uh, re-kind of constructed and um, reimagined for historical purposes. So the painting has been applied virtually so you can go online and zoom in and see all the cracks and the details. And um, what I found really interesting about the discussion that was provoked by their project was the rhetoric that was used in the process. People were calling it an art heist and a hoax and saying that it was theft of someone else's property, referring to it as privacy, um, that they had looted the material from the museum or even it had been stolen. And so with this type of discourse, you know, we really start to attribute the work back to the museum, or we start to think about it in terms of the current possession and the current generation and ownership of it, and kind of leaving out the, the historical context in the process. So the fact that it was taken from Germany under kind of, or excuse me, taken by Germany from Egypt under dubious um, uh, kind of means of collecting it. Um, and this rhetoric, I think, is also really relevant to what we do today when we're thinking about copyright and we're using things online and, and ownership and um, who owns the new work or is it even new? So, you know, maybe sit on that or think about that when you're looking at the Nefertiti hack downstairs because I'm so obsessed. So. <laughs> I'm Duncan Poulton. I did a piece in the show called Pygmalion. Um, I essentially, all my work is made out of found content that I, I spend a really long time doing very targeted uh, internet searches for 
various weird and wonderful uh, CGI models that other people make. And then I kind of compose them into these new structures, new frameworks. Um, and uh, I show in film festivals and exhibitions equally. Um, I suppose what this piece was trying to say is uh, it's looking at how multiple versions of the same object or original coexist together and uh, how that kind of changes people's idea of what perfection might be in when you know when uh, the digital creation method can make anything into anything why do we still adhere to uh, ancient inherited ideas of what beauty is um, and the title Pygmalion refers to a Greek myth about a um, a Greek king who couldn't make couldn't find his perfect woman so he, he sculpted her out of ivory and then she came to life and uh, well it, some bad stuff happens basically <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's kind of uh, looking at yeah perfection and where that where that lies when you're working in a digital realm um, yeah so I I guess I am kind of typical of the young post internet art, art guy who is uh, just using stuff kind of willy nilly <laughs> um, I guess I'm testing testing the water a bit in, in that way um, so my work's not really about copyright, but in using found content, it kind of implicates itself um, within that. Uh, I don't know if that's a good <laughs> thing to say. Okay, yeah. Um, thank you, everyone, for your introductions. I think um, what we'll do now is just like have a discussion uh, amongst ourselves about some of the issues. And even if we could talk a bit about uh, the works, the other works that are in the exhibition as well. And, and then we'll open it up to the uh, floor, shall we? But yeah, not quite yet. <laughs> okay. um, in fact, drawing up then on um, what Duncan was talking about, um, how and what I mentioned earlier, which is like this reuse of, well, using of found imagery is just inherent to being a young person today, being on the internet. And um, I wanted to, in a way, ask about if everyone hears opinion, but also paying reference to the Left Shark piece, uh, because um, that is very much built on, um, well, yeah, found imagery. Um, I'll introduce this piece because uh, the artist Fernando Sosa couldn't be here because he's uh, in Orlando and it costs a lot to fly people over. But the, <laughs> um, so this piece here uh, started when Katy Perry, um, you know, Katy Perry, she, she did a performance at the Super Bowl in 2015. And as part of it, she had um, people in animal costumes dancing around her. Um, if you like Katy Perry, it was amazing. And pe to what, uh, people either side of her were people dressed in co shark costumes. And the one on her left was basically out of sync with everything else. And uh, they tried to claim it was intentional, that it was them being playful, but whatever. But because the Super Bowl has many millions of viewers, immediately it became like a meme, left shark. And it was about individuality and basically just having fun and being a bit of a loof, really. <laughs> and what happened here, um, like there were many, many memes made of it, almost instant instantly, uh, small images, GIFs, what have you. And what one artist, Fernando Sosa, uh, who made this, did was just what, late one night, immediately afterwards, made a 3D model. And like, it's not the most complicated of 3D models at all. It wasn't made through 3D scanning. Uh, it was just one artist making a representation of what was on screen. And immediately, well, very soon after, um, so he uploaded it to a website called Shapeways, which you can just download 3D models, which you might have got some of your 3D models from there. Uh, not that one. Oh, okay. Another one. So yeah, there's multiple <laughs> sites for sharing 3D models. And Katy Perry's lawyers demanded that it be taken down because they were trying to claim ownership of the left shark imagery. Um, 
which luckily it received a fair amount of attention from the media because like a lot of people were kind of going oh is this right or wrong but um and so after a while like a lot of fighting there was it was allowed to, it went back up on a different side but then what followed was the katie perry's lawyers tried to trademark left shark and like my own internal debate is like i think it's a kind of a wrong thing to do because they may have hired the person the dancer and then hired the costume but to claim ownership of the symbol of left shark what it means like the name left shark that's a shark costume not left shark if you see what i mean and i think that this appropriation of i like just the the, the cultural side of things is um where it gets into dangerous territory because maybe they did have maybe they could have a claim to remove the image online but to then try and claim ownership of the name um and i think this is something which happens with a lot of i guess internet cultures and well you might see it already with styles of clothing whatever like we take from uh, places so um yeah and i think with your work with appropriation is like is is it okay that you're doing it? <laughs> really? Yeah, because like this is what a corporation has already done as well, but um, you're doing yeah. it at the same time. It becomes like a weird thing between individual versus individual, individual, or individual versus organization. In which case, it's kind of I don't know. I think I think there's in the art world there's a lot of like anecdotal stuff that's said about copyright and other things that might be illegal like health and safety <laughs> in which yeah. the, most things are fine <laughs> is the basic <laughs> uh, kind of what people tell each other at private views mm. I would say um, so yeah I think generally it seems to be where money where big money is involved that's where it's n not okay anymore mm. it's the general rule of thumb uh, <laughs> yeah and not being copyright lawyer. Just to put in just a couple of funny things. I was reading the, the correspondence between the lawyers and um, for the trademark application, which I believe they eventually withdrew, the photograph in the trademark application is actually Sosa's 3D model. <laughs> uh, that, that's on his own side and he, he, he swears that's true. So again, that tells you the kind of nonsense that's going on. Also, I think there was some kind of uh, non-copyright claim, might have been unfair competition or something, but th you know, reading some of the literature around this, it was the meme, you know, it was the memes, it was the public reaction that gave this thing value. If the shark exactly. danced properly, as Katy Perry and everybody else intended, there's nothing to see here, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. so. And I, I mean, I think that's it. There is a difference, because I think one of the things you were saying, Duncan, was, oh, so one of the things you do is mine the internet for mm. the obscure, right? Yeah. Now, what Katy Perry's lawyers are doing is appropriating, you know, that mm. phenomenon that has engaged millions of people, that creates the thing that gives it value, just as Shane said. I and mean, I think those are two mm. very different types of practices. They, they might both be unlawful, but they're very different types of practices still it's almost like um the amount of coverage or effects that something has dictates how much value it has yeah. in yeah. in this case because a lot of the videos that i use have they're like they're on youtube and they've got less than 50 views they're kind of washed up on the shore of their so the, no the one cares cultural about detritus right? yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah nobody cares about it anymore yeah, yeah. it's been abandoned I, nobody yeah. watches i had a quote from um Handel, the composer, and he he basically stole a guy's uh, an Italian composer's composition, and then he said uh, it's much too good for him. He did not know what to do with it. Yeah. So it's kind of like <laughs> <laughs> it's this weird thing of like uh, they, they did such. it all the time, right? You know, romantic yeah, composers, yeah. romantic authors, they plagiarized, copied all the time, right? It's just endemic because it's part of how we create, we appropriate transform whether knowingly or unknowingly that's just what we do and it's always been like that and like digital makes the scale different but it but it's a it's a practice that is as old as you know as it is mm. Mm. yeah i guess that's kind of how i qualify it to myself that no one else would no one would watch this again mm. if i didn't do something with it um 
and I guess it's the degree to which you're transforming the meaning. Hmm. I kind of try and approach the the internet like a magazine, like tear pages out, yeah. um, which is probably a <laughs> bit of a risky idea. But um, yeah, I think a lot of kind of post-internet artists treat it in in that way. I mean, things get decontextualized all the time, like Tumblr is pretty guilty of that. Just mm -hmm. uh, the the meaning and the artist, the cur uh, creator just gets lost within a few shares. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. so no context, basically. We won't mention Pepe de Frog in this uh, context as well, uh, how that got uh, misappropriated. <laughs> but yeah, that's a for another time. <laughs> <clears throat> Any thoughts on you, Andrew? Or we can discuss a Nevo piece. Um, well, something that I thought was interesting that you said uh, was just your attitude toward it about the internet and what's available, and if it's online, then maybe we can reuse it. And I think that's something that you know newer generations are kind of just assuming is the case. Um, which is maybe okay because maybe the law needs to adapt to that and figure out a way to um, accommodate the new ways and the new technologies and um, copying in an online environment. But I also think that it uh, it just reveals how we all kind of need to keep up with that. Like especially um, one of my favorite examples of cultural institutions' rights being infringed is um, a. Twitter account called Medieval Reacts, and it takes <laughs> online or it takes images made available online by you know libraries and archives that are kind of like medieval manuscripts of weird stuff happening. Like I'm sure you've seen um, some examples, but then it, it puts hilarious little captions and quotes beside them. And um, it was a 19 year old kid in the UK who created this Twitter account as part of a big social media conglomerate, and so that's commercial use. Um, violating all these websites by using it on Twitter in this way and it was viral like he got more than 400,000 followers in the first six months and then of course copycat accounts started popping up of medieval reacts so all these people who were trying to kind of free ride off of you know everything that he had been doing and the popularity he had generated and when this kind of hit um, I guess the mainstream and people started to realize this was going on he was interviewed in a, in a newspaper article and asked how he felt about the copycat accounts and the kid was like well it's totally fair game you know the only way to make sure that you become the source of all of this is keep on top of yours and make sure it always gets better and stays ahead of all of the other copying and it's a really interesting way to kind of think about what the incentives are behind mm -hmm. copyright what is original you know what direction we're trying to push this in and what type of new creative acts we are trying to inspire um, so I think, you know, I'm coming from an artist perspective, I'm all about copyright, but also coming from like an educational perspective, I'm all about the exceptions, but then coming from, you know, so <laughs> there's a lot of different kind of things being pulled in each way. Mm -hmm. And in fact, like the, the, even the name of the exhibition, um, no copyright infringement intended. I admit it's a long, uh, title, but, um. I'm, I'm going to take a guess that we've all kind of like been on YouTube, watched like a music video, and the description somewhere features something similar to no copyright infringement intended. Um, and yeah, again, it's just for me pointing to the disconnect between the law and what we understand of it. Yeah, as if that insulates you. Yeah. Oh, so I didn't mean to. Yes, yeah, yeah. so I've got a shield now. I can. I'm, I'm protected <laughs> because I use that those magic. Mm. How many words? Four words, um, which yeah, is, is complete rubbish, really. But uh, yeah, we um, we use it a lot, and yet it doesn't do, really do anything. So yeah, I, I I've kind of fallen in love with uh, YouTube captions, spending a lot of time on YouTube as I do, because um, <laughs> a lot of the videos that I I use are kind of te like test, like uh, they make something in three D animation software and then they upload that as an uh, unfinished test version. And the YouTube caption they often put is like, it's very self-effacing, it's like, oh, this is so crap, you know, uh, I'll, I'll upload a better one. It's kind of like <laughs> telling people that it's not their best work and that they don't, maybe disassociating themselves with, from it, from the get-go. Yeah. They just didn't know what to do with it, that's what they're for. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. 
just to not give it to me. Um, <laughs> no, um, yeah, it's quite a. There's, there's a lot of like urban myth just in like online forum mm. kind of context as well, mm. which probably has more sway over things than maybe like actual copyright law, because mm. a lot of artists aren't that well versed in it, as I'm sure you can imagine. And uh, and often. Um, talk about kind of legal and social norms <coughs> often those are grounded in a particular jurisdiction typically the US you know around fair use which is very different from the UK system so there's you know kind of myth making around what you can and can't do because it's fair mm. but that's specific to one jurisdiction not the rest of the world you know but but th that dialogue um, I guess because YouTube uh, and a lot of the the kind of um, the reuse material is is driven by US user, it's user generated content that's also shaping those understandings I mm. guess right and expectations. I th I think there's a huge blurring you know in this country in particular that 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 you know th th kind of if a work is is transformative in the US it gives it a much a much better chance yeah. of the defense standing up and I think that's kind of bled over here that people you know, uh, believe that, whereas we've only had very kind of tangential of approval of transformativeness in mm -hmm. in, a, in well one case in particular. You know, so it's that's, mm -hmm. yeah. and but you have all the myths, the ten percent, the six yeah. percent, the one chapter. You know, it's it's. I I really like the idea that there's such a fine line between what's transformative and what's not. That mm -hmm. in the creative process, you could just make one wrong decision and and kind of get yourself into a lawsuit and mm -hmm. if you made a different decision you, it would have been fine and it's like. a judge yeah. it's, a, right. yeah, it's, yeah, a, yeah. it's right. a judge determining that which is scary that might be a good segue into the uh, Luke Toyman's piece actually because uh, I'll bring that up on screen so um, in the booklet it's got like an emoji as a title in brackets for Luke Toyman's and um, the um, I want to talk about what I know of the copyright case because um, yeah, I, I don't know all, everything of it, but um, so Luke Toymans, famous painter, uh, used uh, an image which looks pretty much like that um, as the basis of a painting. And the original photograph was by Catherine Van Giel, and he got taken to court over it for copyright infringement, uh, sorry, plagiarism. And he defended using, I think, a new law, a newly introduced law in the UK saying about it's okay if it's parody. So he eventually lost. Um, I don't know if they settled out of court, but like basically it was, it's now kind of set in precedent for other, some of the things to happen. And um, this work um, by an artist in Chicago, based in Chicago called Christopher Mirdu is basically inviting the whole of the internet to take the same image and make memes out of it. So use it in their own way, which by the way, you can do yourself and submit it to uh, the website and it'll go in the exhibition if you should want to. And yeah, you can see all these these remixes are somewhat playful. Some of them are animations. Some of them are just still images. Um, and yeah, again, it keeps pointing to the fact that this is a common practice on the internet to take something from it. But and you know, harking back to what you were saying before about it's uh, about if there's money to be made. Mm. But um, yeah, where where was the or is there a line or a clearly defined line? And yeah, you know, using. I know you know more about the parody law, and mm. maybe as well. But is is there almost acceptable usage, uh, or an acceptable line, or enough of a? Well, well, did you have enough of a case, for example, to say it's okay to use it, or is it completely open and shut case? Well, I suppose the problem with parody in a lot of art is that it requires humour, and and that's just not going to apply to whole swathes of art. Um, and again, back to what it, mm. you know, sent to Duncan a minute ago, that you you, you know you have a judge. Um, trying to decide the intent, you know, in relation to whether this is funny or intended to be funny, and that's that's not ideal. And we also have this, you know, criteria now that there there, that there shouldn't be a, a discriminatory message associated with it. Um, so you know that again, it's getting qualified and it's getting qualified. And in this case, you know, with parody in the UK, it's also within the fair dealing system. So it has to be fair as well as everything else. Um, and it, it just the lines are, you know, even with fair dealing in this country, there's six or seven factors that you have to weigh and you have to balance. And I mean, with that amount of variables, it's it's impossible to draw to draw, you know, 
um, you know, in a case, a famous case that was said, you know, fair is what a fair-minded and honest person will think. Best, best to look with that, yeah. I'm gonna, I'll give you the answer that I give to most copyright-related questions that I get asked. It depends. <laughs> and, and, and that's my expert opinion. That's my expert opinion. <laughs> yeah. And if you have money, if you have money, you know. I'll tell you why it depends. Yeah. yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> no, but if you, I mean, if you're, if you're, as I say, if you're not, if you're a, an artist that's not selling much, then, you know, you will most probably be left alone. But if oh sure, yeah. I mean, you know, it's it, it, often it's not about copyright uh, managing rights; it's about managing risk. And that you know that's that's often what people are doing, and you know we've already alluded to it. Um, it's it's when you're dealing with high profile work, so when you're a high profile artist and people think there's money to be made through litigation, that's when litigation happens. Mm -hmm. If you're not a very um, uh, wealthy artist, who's going to sue you? What's the point, right? They might sue Arts Council England, but they're not going to sue you because there's no there's nothing to be gained. Yeah, I have no money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Disclaimer. So, but um, coming back to your work as well, uh, despite your own risk. So, like in your work or your this this artistic work, are you approaching it, I guess, as researchers or as artists? Because in what I'm thinking is that you could claim that it's part of your research. It's quotation. It's you know, it's in my PhD, and I'm, I'm using it um, to exemplify what I'm talking about. And it, are there, say, a different set of rules governing research uh, than it would be for an artist where it's like, oh, I'm making an artwork which I could potentially sell or whatever. So is, with your work, are you, do you think, is your approach, does your approach matter coming out as artists or researchers or is it, yeah? Um, well, I'll let you answer the, the heavy bit of that, but we definitely <laughs> took that into consideration. Hang on, I'll do it in two words. It does, it does matter. <laughs> That's okay, I'm done, I'm done. <laughs> Um, more so, like, we took that into account when we were um, thinking about the concept of the piece. So when we displayed this, each title card that, you know, when you, you can go online and you can download the exhibition file and the title card, the file is there for you to print, like, all the reproduction information, everything is in a contained folder. But each title card says whether or not the institution has released that image to the public domain or it says if it's copyright protected, and if so, who the copyright holder is, and then, which is usually the institution, but sometimes also the photograph. But then if you wanna buy it, okay, because usually that is the line between um, kind of fair use, fair dealing, or, t or research, that sort of purpose, and then as soon as it crosses the line of commercial, that's when infringement gets crazy. So um, in the instance that you would want to purchase that print, like if it was by an artist and we were selling it, we put that information on the title card, how much that print would cost you. And we listed the price as the actual license fee by the institution. So in some cases it was like a hundred pounds. In some cases it was something like 800 pounds. In some cases the institution doesn't say. So it was just like contact this person for more information, which is, you know, price, price available upon request, right? So we tried to play into kind of every aspect of what it would be like to host a real exhibition of these works and offer them for sale to the public, um, because that's essentially what institutions are doing online through their own online collections. Um, so is, was that answering the question? Yeah, it, okay. it did. I, think, I mean, it, uh, I said it does matter. It, it, it does also matter in this, uh, our, our approach does matter in the sense that um, not all exceptions to copyright apply to everyone, right? Mm -hmm. Some of them are specific to institutions like schools or libraries or archives um, or museums. Uh, some of them are specific to um, professions. And some of them are um, general in the sense that anybody can rely upon them. So the, the new exception that we have for parody, mm -hmm. anybody is entitled to rely upon the exception for parody. And it's not limited to non-commercial use either. As long as what you're doing is fair, whatever that may or may not mean, we don't know. There are factors that we can uh, think about. But as long as what you're doing is fair, you can do anything with anybody's work, so long as it's a parody, without having to ask their permission, whether it's for commercial or non-commercial purposes. Now, for us as researchers, there's also an exception that says uh, fair dealing for non-commercial research is also okay. 
So keeping on the right side of that commercial non-commercial line was important for us because that's an exception that we can rely on to explain why we're doing what we're doing. We can also rely on other exceptions, but, but that's one of them and that, that was an important one for us and it's one that is available to us as academics and, and researchers. I, suppose. So. I find the thing with uh, parody quite strange because it implies that it has to have humour. But, but there's no rule for like other emotions like mm. a lot of what I try and do is like <laughs> inject uh, inject a, another emotion onto something like tragedy yeah. um, feeling uh, like empathy for a, a digital avatar or something Ma- mainly through piano music um, <laughs> it's a good that's, way that's, that's way. way that's <laughs> um, uh, yeah but it's just it's just funny that it has to be in some way funny Whereas parody really is just about criticising something or making people see it in a different way, I guess. Yeah, mm. I mean, it, it, that is a really interesting point that, I, that I've never really thought about before. But, I mean, we, you know, we know, at the moment anyway, in the UK there must be humour, right, mm. if you're going to rely on the parody exception. Why? Because the European Court of Justice, has, or the Court of Justice of the European Union, has said that. There was a very famous case that was decided a couple of years ago that said humour is essential, right? Um, so yeah, what about the other emotions, right? Mm. How how do we uh, give voice or articulate other emotions? Um, and are, are there analogous and long-standing practices that also speak to those emotions? I'm not sure. I mean, parodies and, and parody satire, all, all that mm. kind of stuff. You're right, is born out of political critique, um, a lot of it. Um, but sh- but humour is there. Uh, uh, I, do, I mean, I don't know about other artistic practices that speak to other emotions that perhaps we should be trying to enable. Yeah, um, well, I, I was just talking to these guys about an artist called James Richards, who he was no- nominated for the Turner Prize a few years ago, and he, he makes kind of video collage works from quite obscure sources, but kind of makes them into these very intimate, um, claustrophobic, and almost like moving mm. things. So in a way, that's critically using the source material to change its yeah. meaning and change how people feel about about it. So, of course. But he doesn't, from but what I've heard, he doesn't, yeah. I also think it's um, a bit unfair, in a way, to, to have to make the argument that, oh, yeah. my artwork is a parody of something else, and that's yeah. why I should be able to do this. Like, um, especially in Luke Toyman's case, his the initial verdict, uh, and I just looked it up, so that's why I was on my phone, um, <laughs> was uh, 500,000 euro oh, as wow. um, a, cr- a criminal a plagiarism fee. And, of course, he appealed, and then they settled out of court, but... You know, I think what box does that put artists in where they have to say, they either have to adjust their vision so that it does become a parody, or they have to somewhat demean their vision, you know, afterward by saying, no, 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 this is defendable because it's a parody and here's why. Um, I think if you look at Luke Timon's painting compared to the original photograph, and if you're aware of the Belgian politician that he was referring to and the comments that he was trying to make, um, from a conceptual art point of view, absolutely, that's original. It's not plagiarism. Um, it's very much in reference of the photograph, and that's the point. Like that's v- it's tied into the concept of the piece, but the law doesn't allow for that. Like the law isn't, or maybe just Belgian law, um, but mm-hmm. you know, it's it's not adaptable to the to the to the pace that art takes, which is always being redefined. Like the law has to be defined, and art is always being constantly redefined. It, 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 just two things. One, we also had a discussion when we were putting Display Your Own Wrist together about the range of exceptions that we might rely upon, and we discussed parody. You know, is, the, is this a thing that we could also present a, as part of justification? And we, I guess, decided we didn't want to do that because, it, you know, to, you know, a, a lot of what we're doing is in celebration of those institutions, not because we want to piss them off, right? You know, we want to celebrate the work. We want to celebrate uh, the work that they do in caring for and curating uh, these pieces. The, the other thing about uh, boxing work and or narratives I- I- into um, like square pegs and, and round holes is very famous, one of the most influential kind of uh, US uh, copyright decisions of, of recent time was about um, a reworking of Gone with the Wind called The Wind Ungone. 
Uh, and it was decided about 10 years ago or something like that, I guess. Some, some I don't know this. Probably longer, okay. I don't know why I don't know So it, it's one of the key cases in US copyright doctrine that really established the doctrine of transformativeness, right? Yeah. So if you yeah. take a work and you do something with it, you're transforming it into something new and therefore that, that should be regarded as fair. When this, this went to the Supreme Court and when um, it was moving through the, the courts, the argument that this was a parody began to get traction. Now it wasn't sold initially to the public as a parody, but before the case got to the Supreme Court, every new edition was called The Wind Gone, a parody. Right? <laughs> because they, that's how they were boxing and presenting the narrative, even if it was not intended uh, to be that in the first instance, simply because it gave them legal traction. And they were successful in the end. I think, yeah, I think w when you hear you guys talk about shoehorning work into the categories, it is frustrating and the American approach does begin to look more attractive, you know, that, you know, you have your fair use in the States, you have your factors, but if you're, if it's a productive use, if it's a transformative use, I mean, this has been knocking around since 1984, but is now, you know, is now extremely dominant in fair use analysis, again, so much so that it will perhaps be reined in in the next couple of years, but for the moment it's extremely strong. And surely, you know, particularly in the States, copyright is there to encourage production of new works and, you know, um, rather than, like you say, restricting the kind of emotions that you're going to privilege mm -hmm. and things like that, surely if you're generating new work and, you know, exactly you know, a lot of the cases in, 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 in fair use, it's been a different function, a different meaning. You know, if you're doing that, you know, isn't that what we're all trying to do, encourage mm. creativity? Otherwise, everyone's just making, like, memes, <laughs> which are uh, <laughs> apparently fine. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I wanted to move on to the Rihanna piece, if that's okay. Yeah, super. <clears throat> so, uh, one of the, the videos as you walk in, the one that's got all the sound playing, um, it's a project by an artist called Nick Breeze, who's based in Chicago as well, um, and it's called uh, Diamonds Green Screen Version, which is, in itself is a play on um, Oliver Larrick's um, green screen parody video. <laughs> Mariah Carey. Sorry? Is that Mariah Carey? Yeah, Mariah Carey um, one. And it centers around... Uh, an aesthetic, an internet aesthetic called C-Punk. So I've got the uh, Tumblr tag here for you, uh, just to, uh, to give an example. So for those who are unknowing of what C-Punk is, essentially it's kind of like, imagine Windows 95, or like, in a way, MTV from the 1980s. Very highly saturated visuals, uh, almost terribly, um, or somewhat nice way, amateurish visuals pinks, blues, dolphins, whatever. And it's just something that exists on the internet. Um, people kind of started on Tumblr in the mid, oh, yeah, 2010s. And people have been doing it, just like other underground art forms. And in, I think it was 2014, or maybe even earlier, uh, Rihanna performed her song Diamonds uh, on Saturday Night Live and, uh, against a green screen. And what we saw at home was uh, this these sea punk aesthetics. So if you, uh, I'll actually click on that image. What well, it's a bit blurry, but uh, yeah, you you see that's what we see at home. And the internet kind of got a bit annoyed about this because they felt it was um, in a way stealing, um, appropriating without acknowledgement. Um, because as far as we are aware, and well, it's been a while now, so I can almost confidently say like they didn't consult any prominent c-punk artists for to do this so they weren't necessarily giving back to the community and um, it was almost like a smash and grab take what you can whilst it's popular and then move on to the next thing and um so what uh, nick breeze did in response to that was to again just like the luke toyman's video uh, was to invite people to uh, remix it so she, he he re-green screened it um, so I'm just trying to find an image for you as well. So he re-green screened it and then gave the video back to us. It's only a 40 second video that he uh, gave gave them. And there were so many different remixes. It's um, unbelievable. I, Yeah, actually I'll just let that video play on the background. So yeah, and it's almost unrecognizable what it looks like now because it's just taken out of context. Like you've got people um, 
overlaying other memes, you've got people putting horse videos on it and just doing whatever with it. And that's in a way to almost reclaim the, the video, the aesthetic, take it back. But I had issue with this in some way, like this idea that it was stealing because, and I also have issue with the issue that I have, <laughs> um, <laughs> because isn't this just what happens? And where, where, what is the issue really that, we're, that they're dealing with? Is it that someone took the artwork, took their aesthetic, their, do they feel like, oh, it's mine and I own it? Or is it that a corporation took it? And isn't, is, is like a corporation different from a person? If they were to take and appropriate just like we do with our memes and, um, and everything, is it different from what, what we do all the time? And if so, how? Question. <clears throat> Anyone who's like, what's the go? I think, I mean, I think that is a good question. And I think this is a different kind of situation from the Kitty Perry situation, you know, like mm. riding on the crest of a, of, a, of a kind of a, whatever it's called, a meme, right? I think, mm. right? But by the way, some of us remember MTV from the mid 80s and enjoyed it tremendously. I'm just going to say <laughs> I that. I really liked it. Right, yeah. <laughs> I really um, Paul King, he was all over it, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. Right at the start, all over it. Paul King's DM boots. Um, you need to look that up. Okay, uh, <laughs> Um, what was I saying? Corporate versus. Oh yeah, I think this is different. I think this is different from, from the Kitty Perry example, um, and I, I agree with you. I mean, it, my question would be, well, why not? Like, what is the difference here between Rihanna? Let's say she makes a decision, or creative director, or artist, or whoever is directing the video, to grab some of these images, and why is that different than than mm. you doing it? Because she's got money. Is it? I mean, is that the difference? I don't know. I'm I'm not sure that. The, you know, the internet should have got annoyed about this kind of activity. Obviously, it did. So, yeah, I mean, there are different uh, standards at play. And maybe that's appropriate, maybe it's not. Um, but if you're going to, if you want space, uh, 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 and if you want to enable that kind of activity, it's got to apply equally, mm. right? I think it's also about where it's seen. I think a lot of um, kind of internet culture, the annoyance has happened where they're taking something that's existed only on the internet as a, meme or whatever mm. and then bringing it into the real world and getting loads of people to see it on like terrestrial tv and i don't know i guess that's where the their qualm can, comes from don't in, in the sense that they don't want the exposure don't like the exposure don't it, it's it's taking the work out of context yeah and so that's so. derogatory in some way right? yeah i guess it's, it's kind of um yeah uh, uh, yeah locating it in a context that the artist disagrees with Right, yeah, some kind. and then the, the thing of not asking then <coughs> becomes more of a problem, maybe. Okay. Doesn't it? Antonio is more into the hey. internet stuff, isn't he? <laughs> I guess. <laughs> but still, your opinions are value. Like, again, is it is it that issue about permission? Should they, if they had, I guess, asked, but do they ask the whole of the internet? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is it okay if I do this, please? Um, yeah, it's, it reminds me of a story. This friend of mine made a... A uh, mashup video with loads of um, people who'd recorded themselves playing uh, at, at work in London, like a bus driver singing and being creative whilst on the job. Yeah. Like, really nice video. And he got, he actually asked permission from every single YouTube user. This is going back 10 years. How long has YouTube been a thing? More than that. So. More than that. <laughs> at the start of YouTube. And then he got all these permissions uh, from individuals, and then YouTube changed their like messaging service and basically deleted all his record of the permissions and he had no way of contacting these people so then how do you then take that to like an art fair and put it in a context where it could be bought yeah. you know there's a lot of issues around sustainability of art practice when it comes to using other people's of course stuff i suppose you know my my research on conceptual art have kind of come come up against this you know there's uh, the writer Daniel McLean who has a theory that there's an artistic commonwealth amongst high artists that they share um, but you find as you begin to step outside the community you know whether people are using it for you know merchandising or things like that the the, the rules break down but I, I think that's you know a really interesting issue even you know from from my research kind of there was, at times there was almost a subjective assessment by the 
artist of do I like it, do I respect it, mm -hmm. you know, the word that kept cropping up at me is it's serious, you know, and that's for the that's for the high art community, the you know, based around the gallery system, for the internet, you know, I'd, I'd be very curious to mm -hmm. what what those criteria are if you looked into them, you know. That's funny how except I feel like the art world is completely at odds with like internet culture in some ways. Like you say, they they say is it serious, whereas copyright law wants it to be a parody. The internet wants it to be another thing, and there's a there's a kind of conflict between the art world model of wanting things to be finite uh, and scarce to have value, sure. yeah, um, like limited editions, but then you want your work to be seen at the same time and then if if it's seen online then it's copied into like cache internet caches you send it to a festival and they've got copies and it's a lot of it's just like a verbal agreement or like trust which mm. is kind of strange i think there needs to be a new that's um, actually a, another good point about uh, the nefertiti hack was the museum that holds the Nefertiti bust also makes a version available online that they have 3D scanned and repainted and it's a reproduction limited edition for 9,000 euro excluding that. So this was one of, you know, it's a limited edition. You can sell it. There's an online cart in order to purchase it and order it. Um, so when the data was released and it's such high quality and made available for everyone, um, I think their like official response was, "We are not amused." <laughs> so, um, but I mean, that's it's a great point because I also, in a way, I feel like, and I take this very personally, when a band that I like starts to become like liked by like the Coachella crowd, right? And then I feel like it's ruined, you know, like mm. some something about the aura of it has yeah. um, has shifted for me and. Um, the meaning and mm. yeah the aura is a quite an interesting yeah. thing um, yeah very benjamin <laughs> uh, it, yeah it is just gonna say, like people inclined to spend nine thousand dollars plus vat on a on that limited edition reproduction aren't going to stop buying it no. because the hack has happened yeah. right they're not yeah. going to stop buying it because there's a plastic uh, quite lightweight version <laughs> of it sitting downstairs mm. uh, it's just that it's not you know it's not impacting on their business model in that in that respect and there are also so many museums that make their data available online, either um, Shapeways, Sketchfab, that it's like, okay, then why are you possessing this one thing? Um, it really does come down to holding the, the actual physical object and restricting access to that rather yeah. than allowing access the way that um, we should be doing. And that's also why it's still a very analog issue, right? Yeah. 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 Often. Yeah. yeah. Often. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, but even you know, we spoke earlier about you know when you see certain estates like the Rauschenberg estate that have just opened up, yeah, you know they just that's really interesting. They, yeah. they, it, even the the press release, but it's almost like they can't stomach it anymore. It's just too much hassle to try mm. and mm. keep the stuff. That's what's so interesting about that Oliver Larrick project, the three D scans. Do you know about that? Oh, I'll get that. Um, he basically he got a grant to scan 3d scan all the statues in a collection uh, of a museum and then he basically made the the data all the like really detailed scans available online for free reuse creative commons and then it got this amazing like response from the art community um and that that's kind of i feel like that's slightly actually some of the uh models that i used were from this um and he has like a gallery section which shows w what people have done with it. But I feel like this is semi unique, like I haven't seen that many other projects like this. But you can just see how diverse the reaction is to it. Mm. And it's kind of really, I think this is quite a seminal project, really. Mm. It's funny you should mention, um, like, is it, well, not say is it unique, but. Um, the, pe the people who uh, printed the uh, Nefertiti head downstairs, um, it's a guy called Jonathan Beck who works at a company called My Mini Factory, and the project that they have is Scan the World. So it's he it's, he was hopefully going to be here today, but unfortunately he couldn't. Um, and he was saying how like he started it, and it, he just would go into galleries and scan stuff, and then make put it online. But now it's like an official thing, so. There are people who have done it themselves, galleries that have done it and are hosting it on their website. So 
yeah, it is a thing. Oh, it's becoming more of a thing for mm. sure. But yeah, at the time, what Oliver Larrick did, like this was, I can't remember what year he did uh, did this now. Like, it's more than, yeah, maybe. it's a few years old, but like, it still was quite a unique thing. One, to be able to scan something, because how do you, like to be able to preserve it as well, like, and then to make it available and mm. seeing what people do with it. Like I've seen actually some of the models being reused in a few net art videos <laughs> as well. But um, I just wanted to, um, draw upon what you were um, saying as well like and th linking back to what I was saying about um, you know, the trouble with that people have had with the Rihanna uh, videos <laughs> did it just come down to money uh, because even um, yeah I felt that the response the negative response to it was more that like someone's made money off, off this and like not necessarily and that it wasn't us but more that like yeah, we're doing it, it's our passion, we love it, and we're just going to keep making these images. And now someone's just kind of come and made money off the back of what we're doing. And similar to Luke Toyman's piece, like he's a multi award winning artist and everything. So it's like he could be making money off the back of this, getting exhibitions, interviews, etc. And like myself, okay, so I, I'm an artist as well. Hello. And <laughs> I've, I've had to ask this for myself so I'm very much of the, uh, of the free culture movement I share all my images and everything online for free you can use it, download it, repurpose it, whatever and then would I it's not happened yet but would I reach a dilemma when someone has suddenly made a lot of money off my work like yes it's under like very liberal licenses um, we can talk about Creative Commons if there's time but like it's under a very liberal license which allows this but say if Nike came over and said, and just used it, yes, attributed me, put photo by Antonio Roberts, but they're now made like an app, 100,000 pounds, whatever. Would I still feel the same? And um, what, what do you feel about that as well? Like it, with your artwork, if, yeah, you appropriate mm. others, but someone appropriated me yeah <laughs> and even if like you were to now go on and make money from this mm. would you would your priorities change would you want to notify them that you've made money off their work or do you feel an obligation to like to spread the wealth or is it is it that you're just going to keep going and you acknowledge that this copying and sharing is just again part of creativity I think it would change how I felt um if someone copied you or, or probably both i i don't know i guess it depends what the copy is and mm. what it how it changes the meaning if it like if i liked it then mm. it'd probably be fine mm. <laughs> but <laughs> as a general rule of thumb i suppose you can see communities react to i mean when when jeff coons um was putting in train illegal action over the balloon dog and the community kind of reacted really badly and said, no, come on, you know, please, you know, this is what you do, you know. And he dropped it because it just, it wasn't doing his reputation any good. So mm. I guess there's a bit of peer, there can be a bit of peer pressure there as well. Mm. I, th I don't think it's all about money. I just think money makes it more complicated mm. right? for, for the uh, artist, whether they're appropriating or whether they've been appropriated. But, you know, be, just be careful what you wish for if you, if you, if you want this world and you put your stuff out there you just gotta you take it yeah so it's 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 part of the practice right cool um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much to the panel um ronan deasley andrew wallace duncan polton and dr shane burke so are you a doctor as well you're both doctors aren't you honest so okay doctor. Uh, uh, anyway but yeah thank you to you all for coming to the exhibition uh, flying over coming up on trains to talk about the work and then just the issues surrounding it um i'm really happy to have had you in the exhibition and glad that you uh, came to talk as well because this is a topic which as well thank you all for coming as well but that it is very important to us as artists and also just how we experience culture and like if we want to see new things being made we need to consider these issues um before during and after the fact as well not, not just in retrospect asking for permission instead of forgiveness etc so um yeah, thank you all for coming 
tonight. Um, the exhibition does continue on until 21st of May um, here at Phoenix. Oh, sorry, and thank you to Chris Tyra as well. He's standing there in a corner, or sitting there in a corner, for inviting me to uh, curate this. Um, it's been a really, really great opportunity. So yeah, it continues until 21st of May. There will, will be a curator's tour on the 11th of May, but I guess if you haven't seen the exhibition already, I could go downstairs and uh, inch, walk you around it as well. Um, and as well, pick up one of the programs if you haven't already. There are many of them. Many. <laughs> <laughs> Please. <laughs> one. And um, yeah, um, again, thank you so much for coming and have a good evening. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.